Happy Halloween, Pokemon fans! Today I'm going to tackle a truly horrifying part of my past and cover my least favorite video game of all time. Recently I made a list of my top 10 favorite video games of all time, and like clockwork, my top request is now to do a top 10 least favorite games. But to spare myself the torture of playing 10 games I hate, I decided to dedicate an entire video to just my least favorite game of all time. So tonight on this Halloween, which terror will I share with you all? One, Angelica Pickles. Totally Angelica was released in 2000 for the Game Boy Color, and a year later a PlayStation version was released. The PlayStation version has got quite a bit of coverage on YouTube, but the original Game Boy Color version of the game is the one I'm most familiar with, so it'll be the one I'm focusing on today. If you stop to think about it, it's really kind of baffling that this game exists at all. It's really uncommon for licensed shows like this to have spin-off properties that focus entirely on the antagonist of the show. But once you realize this game was conceived by a walking dollar sign rather than a human being, it starts to make more sense. You see, THQ had made a couple of Rugrats games before this. Not terribly good ones, but at least ones that more accurately represented the source material and had a wider variety of playable babies. But evidently they were unsatisfied that mostly boys were playing them. So to reach out to a wider audience, they wanted to make a Rugrats game, among other things, with a female audience in mind. Rugrats as a show had wide appeal to both genders, but there weren't really very many female characters. This was pre-Kimmy. So at the time there was Lil, who wasn't really much of a character on her own. You couldn't make a game where you play as only Lil, not Phil. There was Susie, but she wasn't in very many episodes and wasn't really considered one of the main cast of Rats, since she was a little bit older and mostly acted as kind of a mentor figure to the main babies. So that leaves us with Angelica, who is white and blonde and girly and in almost every episode and perfect for marketing to girls. You know, aside from the fact that she was the show's antagonist and a brat and kids generally didn't like her very much. Now the Totally Angelica brand did not begin with this game. There was an entire line of toys based off the tiny sociopath, most notable of which was a line of horribly creepy fashion dolls. This is where someone somewhere probably should have realized that trying to get young girls to identify with this... You see, Chucky, there are two kinds of people in this world. People who make things better, people like me, and people who just seem to, well, get in the way. People like you. Isn't there anything I can do? Not really, Chucky. The bottom line is, we'd all be a lot better off without you. Grandpa's old. Wait to see how old you are when your time out is over. And as far as you, Chucky, you can forget about having a mom. You know, looking back on it, Spike was a pretty good mom. This is my fault. I don't deserve to have a mom. Enough to sell them toys of her would be a bad idea. But instead, they charged right ahead and made a totally Angelica video game, complete with all the hallmarks of the pink file. What better way to reach out to young girls in an era dominated by the game Boy than to let them know they were taken seriously and respected? With a game based entirely on consumeristic greed and vanity starring terrible, awful, bratty Angelica as their avatar. The box art even has the audacity to cross out Game Boy and write in Game Girl Color. As a kid, wouldn't this just be confusing? Okay, so not every game explicitly labeled Game Girl must be for boys, which means the only games I'm supposed to play must be the crappy ones that think I'm vapid and shallow and terrible. Thanks, video game industry, for welcoming me with open arms. Now this is just my personal experience, but I don't know a single kid who picked this game out for themselves. Everyone I know who had this game, including myself, got it because their parents or some other relative picked it out for them as a gift. Kids weren't fooled into buying this game, but parents just saw the Rugrats logo and got it for their kids, knowing that they like Rugrats. In fact, most of the other people I know who had this game were boys. So regardless of the stupid and largely unsuccessful premise, many kids were subjected to this terrible game anyway and I in particular wasted hours of my life on it, since I had so few games as a kid, and this was one of my only options. I could stop with just this setup alone and leave it at that. It had no chance of ever being a worthwhile game, because it was a zero effort cash in with a lazy half day premise. But what kind of video beatdown on my least favorite game would this be if I didn't talk about the game itself? The goal of Totally Angelica is to collect the best outfit and earn the highest score in the fashion show, in order to unlock different levels of the mall. Each floor has a point total you must score in the fashion show to earn access to the elevator to move up to the next floor. The babies all hate Angelica, naturally, so they grade her outfits very harshly, and you have to keep trying different clothes to impress them. How do you earn these articles of clothing? By playing mini games, of course. 
Like, duh, it's a game for girls, there have to be mini-games. Alternatively, this game had a cutting-edge infrared trading system, where you could trade articles of clothing with your friends instead. Which is hilarious, because the game does not save data, and instead relies on the worst password system I've ever seen in my life. So, since these mini-games are the meat of the program, let's check them out one by one, shall we? There are only five floors, so there aren't that many to get through. On the first floor, we have Phil's Fashions, Susie's Shoes, and Lil's Lipsticks. Phil's Fashions is a standard catch game. You move Angelica left and right to catch the cookies, and it's really, really simple. After you catch enough cookies, you pick some clothes out and move on. Susie's Shoes is the fluffy pinball maze. This is really only a maze by name, because the goal of the game is not to navigate to the exit. Instead, a ball of yarn moves back and forth on a track with springs that bounce, and make it change directions automatically. There's a third spring on the wall near the path that opens up to the next track, and if you press A when the yarn is in front of it, the spring will go off and push the yarn to the next track. You keep bouncing the ball along the tracks until you reach Angelica's creepy bloodshot cat. There's no way to take a wrong path or end up at a dead end. The only challenge, if you can call it that, is that there's an extremely generous timer. It takes a very, very long time, requires no skill, it's monotonous and dull and tedious, and there's absolutely no way to make it go any faster. With no mistakes, this minigame takes a whopping three minutes to complete, and there's three minutes left on the timer. There is literally no way to lose this game. Now remember this minigame, kids, because it's the absolute worst one, and it's not the last time we'll see it. Lil's Lipsticks is a slider puzzle minigame, and this one's actually pretty funny because the AI is so bad, it will often shuffle the pieces so severely that it actually realigns them all for you, so almost every time the puzzle can be solved in a single move. Once you've cleared all three minigames and earned their fashion items, it's time to enter the fashion show. Remember how I said the babies hate Angelica, though? Well, you're not going to earn nearly enough points to advance to the next floor in one go, so you'll need to re-enter the show multiple times in order to earn enough points. But oops, you can't re-enter the fashion show until you burn more clothes. So what do you do? Play all three minigames again, of course, including the torturous fluffy pinball maze. Since two of the three minigames take less than a minute to complete, you can assume that the majority of your time on this floor is going to be spent in the fluffy pinball maze. Lather, rinse, repeat until you've hit 25 points, and then it's on to the next floor, assuming you haven't turned the game off already. On the second floor, we have Susie's shoes, Chucky's chunky jewelry, and Tommy's trims. Susie's Shoes is once again Fluffy's Pinball Maze, unchanged from the last time we saw it. Chucky's Chucky Jewelry is a Simon knockoff, and Tommy's Trims is a matching game, where the AI flips two cards and if they match, you press A. What's annoying about this one is the AI again isn't very good, so it can end up flipping the same two cards over and over and over again for all eternity, which becomes more of a problem the longer you play. The thing about pretty much every minigame in Totally Angelica is that none of them are difficult. But they all require you to pay attention if you don't want to make mistakes, which is difficult because Totally Angelica is such a boring game. The story is the same on this floor. Once again, you play three minigames, enter the fashion show, play more minigames, re-enter and repeat until you have 75 points. By this point, you probably already have some combination of clothes worked out that will net you the most points. So the best bet is, no matter what new clothes you're forced to earn between fashion shows, just re-enter the same outfit over and over again for the most points to get this game over with faster. Once again, assuming you don't get stuck with a particularly miserable AI on Tommy's trims, the pinball maze will eat up the majority of your time on this floor. The third floor has Phil's Fashions, Lil's Lipsticks, and Susie's Shoes. This time, surprisingly, Phil's Fashions is a different game than the Cookie Catch. It's a game where you go around as Phil and Lil catching bugs, which would be a nice change of pace were the game not broken beyond belief. The controls are bad, which is impressive because it literally only requires a D-pad and a single button to perform all actions. As Phil, you move around and press A to pull plants. Then the controls switch to Lil, and you move around and press A to catch the bugs Phil unearths. However, there's a massive delay between when you press A and when she actually moves. You must be at a complete stop in order to catch bugs. Sometimes the A button is completely unresponsive, and the bugs can move under Phil where they're impossible to see. When you're playing as Phil, there are so many things on the screen that the game can't handle it, and Lil's legs flicker in and out of existence. This one isn't any harder than the other games. There's actually no time limit, so it's another game that's impossible to lose. It's just clunky. Like, I'm pretty sure no one figured kids would sit through the three hours of Fluffy's pinball maze required to get to this point, so they didn't bother fixing these things. Lil's lipsticks is the same slider puzzle as it was on the first floor. Now you may be wondering, since Phil's Fashions is a different game this time, does this mean there's a chance Susie's Shoes is different too? Well, take a wild guess at what lies behind door number three, Fluffy's Pinball Maze. Once again, you play the pinball maze until your eyes fall out, 
and span the same outfit over and over in the fashion show until you have 150 points required to move on to the next floor. Floor 4 is actually the last floor of any games, and consists of the same three that were on the second floor, the Simon game, the matching game, and the pinball maze. Since this is the final round of minigames, this means Fluffy's Pinball Maze is the only minigame that is on every single floor, and it's also the only minigame so far that lasts longer than a minute. And it never changes. Totally Angelica is essentially four and a half hours of pinball torture disguised as a game about shopping. Interesting to note is that the Simon game actually ups in difficulty at this floor, with a sequence of five colors rather than four. So they will change the other minigames as you progress through the levels, just not the sacred pinball maze. Once you begin bleeding from all orifices and fantasizing about beating Angelica to death with her own score paddles, it's finally time to move on to the top floor. Floor 5 also consists of three minigames, but only one that matters. The grand finale, Magical Kingdom. This one is actually a side-scrolling level, in which Angelica rides a bouncing unicorn. The basic goal of this game is to collect all six pieces of a bridge throughout the level in order to enter the castle at the end. Along the way there are obstacles, like dwarves, or maybe they're babies, that shoot things at you and send you back, small puzzles to solve, like giving a dog bone to Spike to get the key to the castle, and some of the absolute stupidest controls I've ever seen. The unicorn, when stationary, floats up and down in place. Holding up will make it float higher, but it doesn't really like to stay at one level ever. In order to get a certain piece of the bridge, as well as the apple required to reach the top of the tower, you need to shoot these wells with a wand power up. However, since the controls are so floaty, staying still long enough to aim the wand is almost impossible, and the wells are all positioned between two evil baby things that knock you all over the level, which make it even harder to stay put long enough to aim the wand. Each wand is just one shot, so whenever you fail you have to go find another before you can try again. Moving at all is a pain in the ass, since if you're carrying anything, wands or bridge pieces, you move so slow. Holding A will let you move just slightly faster, but it's barely fast enough to pass the baby whatever evil things before they knock you back. And these things send you far back. One blast will send you half the stage length back. This is by far the most frustrating part of the whole game. The pinball maze is boring and awful, sure, but it doesn't actively piss me off like the Magical Kingdom does. It's not that it's too hard, it's just set up intentionally to irritate you. It's like their goal with this game was to accurately recreate the sensation of being stuck in bumper to bumper traffic on a hot day, in a crappy uncomfortable seat when you're in a hurry, while your least favorite song plays on the radio. If you manage to enter the castle, you're rewarded with a special crown for Angelica to wear. And then the game just kind of stops. There are a couple other mini games on this floor to complete if you want, but there's no point total for this floor, so you don't need to re-enter the fashion show. If you do enter, the special crown you won doesn't really seem to give you a point bonus. There's really nothing left to do. That stupid pixelated crown is your only reward for torturing yourself this far. The end, I guess. A year later, the PlayStation version came out. And while it's slightly more sophisticated than the Game Boy Color version, this one has even less of a reason to exist, because by this point Kimmy was introduced. There's just no excuse for this to have been made. Kimmy is even in the game and you're still playing as Angelica, who they take extra pains to remind you is a terrible blight on humanity with an opening cutscene in which she throws a temper tantrum because she can't open a box. And what minor things this version may have improved on from the Game Boy Color version, the awful annoying voice clips and music make it even less bearable. At least the music in the Game Boy version, low effort as it was, was generally unoffensive and it didn't actively assault you with its awfulness. Third loading screens see more of your life away, and Susie is conspicuously missing from this entire game, in spite of being on the front cover and disc artwork. And of course, Fluffy's Pinball Maze is in this one too, and they've added more things to make it even slower. Burn it! So that's Totally Angelica, my least favorite game of all time. It's lazy, contrived, and malformed in virtually every aspect, and no other game have I loathed so thoroughly from start to finish. It's downright insulting that anyone would think little girls would relate to such a terrible person, and even more insulting that whoever conceived this monstrosity thought so little of girls' interests. In fact, this game may actually have been the reason I don't like clothes shopping. I've never dedicated an entire video to just ripping on a single game before, so let me try and leave on a positive note. Though there may still be problems in the video game industry and how it treats and represents women and girls, let's take solace in the fact that for the most part, these days we're seeing way, way better games aimed at young girls. My generation may have had to put up with crap like this, but for the most part, girls today have a lot more to pick from when it comes to games catered to their interests. Games made with girls in mind aren't inherently bad, they just need to be handled with care. So I'm really glad that although Shovelware Crap for Girls is still being made, there are at least companies putting real thought and effort into targeting a younger female demographic, 
which is good for the gaming industry as a whole, because getting girls interested in games at a young age is a big step towards a bigger and more diverse consumer base, and the more girls play and buy games, the more other things in the industry will improve for women as well. So on that optimistic note, thanks for watching, and let me know what your least favorite game is in the comments below. Hope you had a happy Halloween, and if you want to see my last Halloween spooktacular, you can click here for my video about some Pokemon creepypastas. Or if you want to see my top 10 favorite games, you can click right here. As always, don't forget to click here to subscribe for more Pokemon videos. See ya!